I'll start now. That way, as people come in, then we can continue with the reservation or with the presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us in person or um, on our live stream. My name is Lena Ferizzi. I am the Student Services Specialist Senior um, in the Student Leadership Center at Glendale C Community College. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome today um, Gerard Begay, who's here uh, to talk to us about Native American uh, Heritage Month and Navajo rug weaving. Um, before we begin with Gerard's presentation, I'd like to do a brief introduction and uh, then give him his floor. Those of you that are online, if you can, if you if you come up with questions throughout the presentation, please enter them in the chat, um, and then we'll uh, have about 15 minutes or so at the at the end, um, so that we can have a brief Q and A with Gerard. Um, Gerard is Diné, originally from Indian Wells, Arizona, and is a clan and his clan is Big Water. Born for, um, for the Black Streak, Streak Clan. He attended Arizona State University and Northland Pioneer College. Gerard's grandmother, Betty Begay, uh, is Indian Wells, in Indian Wells, Arizona, and Lucy Lee, uh, Greasewood, Arizona, were both weavers. Grandmother Lucy, who introduced Gerard to weaving, uh, she demonstrated how to weave and explain the various styles. Grandma Lucy um, passed away, however, before she could uh, get Gerard to weave. Four years later, in the spring of uh, 2013, Gerard began to weave with the help and guidance of Cherie Monsam, Mary Walker, and Liz Monk. In the fall of 2013, um, he presented Culture and Revelance, the Navajo Rug at the Arizona Indian Education Association Parent Conference. A month later, Gerard brought five 18 by 18 inch pieces to the, Harvard, uh, to the Heard Museum gathering of Weaver's Market. Gerard enjoys weaving most traditional, traditional rug patterns, blankets, uh, twill saddle, blankets, rug dresses, and contemporary designs. He also enjoys exploring creative, uh, the creative process. Gerard um, sees weaving as a uh, therapeutic tool to overcome our day-to-day -day challenges and carry on an art that nearly vanished from his um, immediate family. Most important, Gerard is honored to bring a life back into his grandmother's weaving tools and carry the tradition of weaving. His motto is sharing a legacy of beauty and harmony. Uh, Gerard is a, t well, he, <laughs> I'm speechless because his designs and his uh, art is amazing. You'll get the opportunity to learn a little bit more about it today and then um, talk to him in person. Uh, please join me in welcoming Gerard Begay. Gerard? Your, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? So good afternoon to everyone in person and to the virtual world. Um, it's good to be here today. Uh, I'm excited to share a little bit about my weaving. Um, I started about eight years ago, so that introduction was one of my first introduction. It has since changed. <laughs> um, so a little bit about me. Uh, as, I, as mentioned, I was born in a small community called Indian Wells, Arizona. It's a really small community. Um, and the area that I actually grew up in Indian Wells is called Waterfalls, and it's in Navajo called Tonale. That's where I'm originally from. My clan is Big Water, for those that are familiar with Navajo clanship. That is my first and major clan is Totsohni, or we call it Big Water. Um, and then following that, uh, as mentioned, Black Streak, uh, which is uh, Tsitnajini. That's from my father's side of the family. So we go by our mother's uh, clan, and that's our main clan, and our father follows. So that's how we identify ourselves. Um, as mentioned, I've been weaving about eight plus years. Um, it's been a journey. It's been a great journey for me. Uh, when I first started, I thought it was just going to be weaving. But then it ended up opening a small door, then another door, then another door. And pretty soon I had all these doors 
opening up. So I'll share that with you throughout this uh, presentation. But today I kind of want to just focus a little bit about what is Navajo weaving. You know, you see it um, when you go to the Herd Museum or you see it in stores or gift shops. Um, and kind of just thinking about like, how, does, how are these made? What are the different styles? So kind of going over that. So in my presentation, I want to talk a little bit about the history uh, from a traditional standpoint and also from the Western interpretation because there's both. Then I also want to talk a little bit about my mentors. Um, so my mentors and my tr traditional interpretation kind of mesh together. Um, and then the development of the rug design. So there's various designs that were developed throughout our creations of rugs. And then in the end, I'll have a little Q&A. So I'm going to go ahead and go move on to the people that have made this all possible. So the lady in the blue velveteen uh, with the necklace on, um, she is my grandmother. That is Betty Begay. Uh, she was one of the uh, people that I learned how to weave from. She was early on. She was always a weaver. Um, I, you know, as a young kid, I was the youngest of six, and so my brothers and sisters were off to school. And so what ended up happening was she was my babysitter. And every time I would hang out with her, be around her, she was always weaving. And she didn't want me to go outside to play because it's just me. So she wanted me to play around her, like around her little area, so she could keep an eye on me while she worked. Um, sometimes I got bored of playing, so I would watch her. And she would always explain to me what she was doing. And as a kid, you're like a sponge. You're picking up all this information. So that's my grandmother. Um, then off to the right in the red, that is my grandma, my aunt Hope, my great aunt Hope. That's my grandma's sister. She's also a well-known weaver. Uh, she was very well-known as she um, loved to spin. So what she's doing right there is she's actually spinning yarn. Um, so she's using this tool. This is what she's using in, in the photo. And so she's what she's doing is she's spinning her yarn from raw wool to, to yarn. Um, and then the gentleman in the middle, that is my uncle. And so when I talk about the traditional interpretation of my presentation the stories that I gathered that I heard is from him he's a well-known practitioner he's a well-known medicine person on a reservation um, sadly to say he's starting to lose his memory quite a bit so we're trying to save as much as we can and through uh, my weaving I'm trying to interpret interpret some of his teachings into my rugs so how did Navajo rug start in Navajo culture. Um, according to my uncle, it was said that years ago, at the beginning of time before there was human, uh, the animals that you see today, the insects, the bugs, the lizards, all of that, they were once people. They were people just like us. And there was amongst that, per amongst that group, there was a lady by the name of White Shell Woman, who we believe is our clan mother. She's our mother, our spirit mother. So she just happened to be walking one day, taking an afternoon stroll, and she heard this thump, 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 thump. And she looked around, you know, she's walking out in the desert. She looks around, there's nothing. So she starts walking again. And she hears that thump, 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 thump. And she looks again, you know, and this time she's, it's coming, but she can't, you know, she's trying to figure out where the noise is coming from. This happens four times. And she looks down and she notices that the noise is coming from the earth so she looks down and right at her foot right at the base of her foot where she's standing there's a little hole and from that little hole it was the spider's hole it was a, a you know, went to the spider's uh, hole and she heard a voice saying don't be afraid come on in you know so she looked down and and she was told to blow on the hole you know so she blew with her breath and when she did that four times, that hole expanded. And it became the entry, entryway to the spider world. And she looked down and she saw this ladder that came down from the, from the top to the, to the base of the, to the home inside the spider woman's hole. And she starts climbing down this ladder made of webs. She starts climbing down. And as she's climbing down, she notices on the wall that there's all these beautiful tapestries some of them were shiny, some of them had these beautiful designs. And she gets down to the base, down into the home, and there sat Spider Woman. 
And it's believed that Spider Woman was not a well kept lady. She had like her hair was always bushy, uh, tangled. Her clothing was always matted, and you know she she was an unkept woman. And she sat there. She says, "Grandmother, what are you doing?" And she chuckles and she says, "I'm weaving. I'm creating beauty." <clears throat> and so White Shell Woman gets curious. She becomes curious and she says, "What do you mean? What do you mean? What are you? What are you? What's weaving?" So she explains to her that she's creating a rug. And so then Spider Woman sits down and she starts to explain the process of what she's doing. And back then it was believed that the first material that we worked with was cotton. It wasn't wool, it was cotton. So she got the cotton and she started, you know, she started uh, sorting out the seeds and all this stuff. And then the next thing you know, she's got this little roving of cotton. And with that, she started to spin it. And she had something similar to this, and so she started to spin the, the, the cotton, the, the threads. Um, so after she got done with that, she then put two beams on the side. And in between the beams, she set up her first warp by going back and forth, back and forth. After she created the, the, uh, the loom, or once she was done with the warping, she then secured it, and she stood it up and there was a rug, there was the loom. From that, she started weaving. And she started explaining her tools. Like she says, this is a batten, this is a weaving comb, this is what it's used for. So in our culture, we have names for our tools. Um, our spindle, which is this guy here, we call this be'adizah, or the spindle, the hip spindle. And this is what we use to spin our yarn. Then we have my weaving battens. So I have two different size. I have a wide one and I have a narrow one. It's a thin one. But this is our batten. But in Navajo, we call it big in English. Um, so this is our, our weaving battens. And then this is our comb. So this is my grandma's comb. And I don't use it anymore. I just like to bring it for presentations. But this is my grandma's comb. Um, so we have this one. And we have a small one. And in Navajo, we call this Be'etzo. Um, but in also in Navajo, we, we call this one the one that thumps. You know, the one, So when you actually weave and you're weaving, you're thumping. You hear that thump, 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 thump. Um, so, <clears throat> what's going on? So <clears throat> that was, so that was kind of like this, the beginning of beginning story of how Navajo weaving became to be or came to be so white shell woman took this teaching that she learned and she took it and she gave it to when she created the human beings the five finger people she then took that teaching and gave it to the people to us to learn and to continue to continue that tradition so that was how um, I was told that was a story that my uncle had always told me about Navajo rug weaving um, the Western interpretation is that it's believed that in Navajo, they weren't weavers to begin with. It was the Pueblo tribe. So when I say Western is, is when we, uh, when the white settlers moved into this area and they started to observe this area and start to analyze the place. And so they believe that the Pueblos were the ones that taught the Navajos how to weave. And so the Navajos learned from the Pueblos and from that they then took it to the next level. So I always like to joke by saying that we, the Navajos, made Navajo rug weaving. We took it to the next level and we made it better. Um, I probably get heat for that. <laughs> but um, So that is kind of like the introduction. Um, so that's the belief. And so with Navajo rug weaving, we really started just simple, very plain weaving. and. Our first rugs that we did were just stripes. There was no designs. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide. Actually, this, I'm gonna go over this really quick. This is the Navajo Reservation, current Navajo Reservation as of today. And throughout my presentation, you're gonna hear me talk about places on the Navajo Reservation. You're gonna hear me mentioning like Tisna's bus, which is in the four corner, way up in the, right under where it says Ute Mountain Reservation, around that area, the four corners, that's Tisnazbas. We have Tuba City, 
Um, you have Canyon de Shea, it says Canyon de Shea, but in that area there's a place called Chin Li. So all these different areas on the reservation, they're going to create their own style of weaving. And you'll see that throughout my presentation. So I kind of wanted you to re realize what the Navajo Reservation looks like. Our Navajo Reservation actually reaches into three states. It's Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. So we, we encounter those three states. We are the largest reservation in the United States um, with a population of over 300,000 people. So we're pretty big. So going back, um, so this is our first rugs that we were designing. This is called the first phase cheats blanket and we were kind of known for our blankets. Um, and you can see it's just plain weave, it's just stripes just plain weave. Uh, we started working with dyes. We learned how to dye with indigo from the Pueblos. Um, so a lot of the colors that you see back then were blues, blacks, and whites, and natural colors. There was really no experimental of any colors. Um, so a lot of it was just, like I said, blue, black, and white. So this is one of the first phase blankets that you see. Um, later on, we started to incorporate the reds, which is cochineal, the bugs. Um, but you'll kind of see that also. You'll also see that integrated in the cheese blanket. So this is our first phase, all lines. The next one is going to be um, the second phase. And you kind of notice the, with the second phase how it stripes, but we're starting to break up and make little, like little lines within the rugs. We're breaking up the designs. So we're starting to develop our designs as we're going along. Um, so it's just not just plain weave, it's all that you're starting to incorporate designs. And then also we're starting to incorporate other colors like the reds that you see here. They, all started, they also start to mesh the blues and the reds together to create purple. But you don't see a lot of that in your rug designs. Um, so you have the second phase. Here's the third phase. So from the second phase, we realize that we can break up our designs. We also realize that we can start stacking these designs to create patterns. So you kind of see that within this rug, how the, the designs are stacked to create these little boxes. So you start to see that. And from this era, from the third phase, this is where I believe all the designs developed, you know, because now we're learning how to design, we're starting to build on that design. So we're starting to break up our designs. Um, so from this third phase, from the first, from the second and third phase, we start to de develop designs. We're starting to create our own styles. So people within the area started to create designs and styles. Um, so that's kind of the three phases that we went through was the first, second, and third. So we went from plain weaving to breaking up bars, then to stacking these, these designs. Um, as a result of it, there was an explosion of designs throughout the Navajo Reservation. So like I mentioned earlier, different parts of the reservation started to create different things. So one of them being <clears throat> the burnt water. So this is the burnt water design. Um, it's near where this rug was designed. It was near um, the Gallup area around New Mexico area. So a lot of this, they were very experimental with colors. They love to go out into nature. They like to collect plants. And from that, they started cr to create dyes. So a lot of it was experimental. Um, so they would pick plants, and I do that quite often myself. I go out and pick plants, and I stew it and see what colors I get. So that's what they were doing. So they started creating like all these different palettes of designs. The next one is Chin Li, and I kind of pointed that out in, your, in the map. So Chin Li is the heart of the reservation. That's the kind of the center. If you ever go to Chin Li, you'll notice all these red rocks, these um, canyon walls. So that's what they were kind of mimicking was the red cliffs in, in the, um, in the uh, canyons. And then the next one is crystal design. Very decorative, very intricate designs, but you also notice a lot of bands. You'll notice a lot of these bands, a lot of colors. Very, uh, very similar to the burnt water, but the burnt water is more closed in, whereas this one is like bands of designs. Um, Ganado red is also another very popular design. Um, around Ganado, there's a little trading post that's been around for quite a while. It's called Hubble's Trading Post. So Hubble's is located in Ganado. And if you go to Ganado, you'll notice that there's all these red hills. And so what they did was they took that, their landscape, and they incorporated that into the designs. 
So you'll notice that the background is actually called Ganado Red. That color is actually called Ganado Red. Um, so the next one that we have is Storm Pattern. And Storm Pattern actually created on the western side of the uh, Navajo Reservation near Flagstaff is where that design was created. And so this one is just talking about the lightning and, and it was an interpretation of a ceremony, the lightning ceremony. So that's where that design developed. So really just talking about the, the lightning and the understanding that in four directions, there's four different lightnings that live, and, but they all come together to center. So that's what this, this is what that's mimicking. Um, uh, I was telling you guys earlier in the Four Corners area, that's where this rug was designed. Um, and really it was a challenge. It was a challenge from a trader. There was a trading post there. And so he had an oriental rug. He had an oriental rug that he wanted them to copy. So he challenged the Navajo weavers to copy this oriental rug. And from that, they were able to develop this design, this distinct design. So with the t stuns bus, you'll see these really big, bold patterns, like borders. Within that, they put designs after designs after designs. So it's just like every space that they can put a design, they try to put a design in there. And a lot of vibrant colors are being used for the Tisnaz bus. So again, this was based off of an oriental rug. Two Gray Hills, uh, again in New Mexico. The unique thing about Two Gray Hills is that they don't dye their yarn. Everything that you see here is all natural dyes or the natural wool colors. So they were able to take dark brown, mix it with white, make different shades of brown. They also did that with the blacks. They were able to mix different, um, you know, to get different shades of grays. Um, and then also with the white, they were able to make them bright white or the natural cream colors. So from this, they were able to do quite a bit. So, but everything in this rug is the natural color from the wool. They don't ever dye. So, which is really interesting. A lot of these rugs are highly collected because of that technique. Um, then we have wide runes. Again, very similar to the Chin Li. Uh, it's just kind of a copy of Chin Li. But again, they're using a lot of colors. They're using a lot of natural colors. And a lot of that natural color is coming from the, uh, like the burnt water, where they're experimenting with colors. Our Yei rugs, um, very controversial. It was a very controversial rug that was developed. What happened was that there was a medicine man and so what he wanted to do was preserve his rug, his sand paintings. So sand paintings are only used during the ceremonies. And so during these ceremonies, what they do is they create these huge sand paintings where they then bless the patient on that sand painting. And at the very end, they destroy the whole thing. So it takes all day to create a sand painting. And at the very end, they destroy it and they get rid of it. So the controversy about this was why create something that's going to be permanent? You shouldn't be doing that. And so a lot of the Navajo medicine people were against it because of the fact that it was going to be permanent. So finally they came to the conclusion that, you know what, we can go ahead and do that, but leave a lot of the things out. So what you see here is it's just an image, um, but they left out a lot of the important things like the feathers might be missing or the, the earrings might be missing. There's things that are missing from this, but it's just a replica of it. So they made it to where everyone was happy. And then here's my work. So kind of wanted to talk a little bit about my work and why I do what I do. So the one that I'm holding right there is based off of a story. It's, um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's, about a, it's about the coyote. You know, the coyote was very mischievous. He liked to get himself into trouble. He was everywhere. He was in everyone's business. He knew everything about everything, you know. And, and so what ended up happening was he ended up getting involved with his own daughter and went crazy. So... The only people that could, that could fix this problem that he had with this incest was the moth people, the wing people. So he had to go visit them in order to get saved and to get cleansed. So as a result of it, that's what this whole rug was talking about. It's, talk, it's talking about how amongst chaos, there's always healing. And that's the meaning behind this rug. So that's that, the one that I'm holding. Off to the right, that rug dress that you see in the mannequin, the gray one with the reds, 
That one is actually my one of my, I think it's my second rug dress that I created for my niece as she was graduating from UNM. And their color is gray, red, and I believe white. So what I did was I got as much grays as I could to incorporate that into my rug dress. And then the poncho that you see here with the, the lady with the crown, that poncho is actually a, a study that I did at the Herd Museum. So I had a chance to go down to the Herd Museum and as an artist, if you are an artist, if you're a weaver or a potter or whatever, you can actually go down to the Herd Museum and study a lot of these pieces and be able to replicate. So with this piece, I was challenged to create this poncho. There's an exact replica at the Herd Museum that's on display. So what I did was I took it and I actually measured it, studied the whole piece, and then I took it and I rewove that. The unique thing about the one at the Herd Museum, it was, it was dyed in indigo. And so I replicated the whole design. So that was one of my pieces that I created. Down at the bottom, the mannequin with the little kilt. It's called a uh, dancing kilt. So we used to wear that quite a bit when we impersonated our gods. Um, so what they used to do is wrap it around their waist, and that's how they would wear it. Uh, mainly the men would wear this. Um, so after we got introduced to materials like cotton and other materials, what ended up happening is we got lazy. We stopped making our woven kilts and we started sewing materials together. So as, a, as an honor to my grandfather, who was a dancer, I went ahead and created that and recreated that whole rug, uh, that kilts that I have on display. And then off to the right, uh, the very end, the black and the black and the gray stripes. Um, that one is actually something that I, I like that design. It was a design that some weaver made. And so I asked for their permission to recreate that rug. So I recreated that piece. <clears throat> Keep good. Here's my, my rug dresses. So I'm known for my rug dresses and I'm actually working on trying to create a book that displays all my dresses. So the very top right up here with the one in the blue with the mountain in the back, that is actually based on a lightning way ceremony. <clears throat> so a lot of my rugs that you see um, that I've created in the past have stories that I've heard from my uncle. And for me to remember these stories, I incorporate them into my work. So <clears throat> this blue one is based off of a lightning ceremony and it's talking about in the background, you'll notice that mountain in the back that's called Shiprock Mountain. And it's believed that that's where the birds were created um, in our culture. So what I mean by that is that there was these two big gigantic birds that lived on Shiprock Mountain. And there was these twins that were out trying to make this world a safe place. And these birds, these big birds were actually killing people. And so they had to get rid of them. They had to kill these two birds in order for the world to be safe. So they went and crawled up the Shiprock Mountain. They made it to the very top and they were waiting. And when they got there, they realized there was a nest, but inside the nest, there was four chicks. So they spared their lives. And so what happened was when the female rain came, it started to rain. It was this gentle rain, it was the female rain. And just as they looked up, they saw this huge mother bird coming down. And before it landed, they shot it with an arrow and they killed the bird. Then it started, this female rain started to turn and it started to thunder and you started to see this like rain coming down and that became the male rain. As that happened, there was this bird that came down, it was the father. And as it was again, as it was starting to land again, they shot it again and they killed it. So they plucked all the feathers from these two big birds and then they turned to the four chicks that they saved, that they spared their lives and said, you're gonna be used in our ceremonies going forward. So of the birds, one of them became the eagle, one of them became the hawk, one of them is the um, vulture, and the other one was an owl. So those are the four, four, the four main birds that were created. Um, so with the feathers that they plucked, the, they took it and they had it in this big bag this huge bag and and they were trying when they got to the edge of the mountain um, at the edge of that mountain they realized it was too far down it was easier to crawl up but to come down was harder so they were stuck so what happened was spider woman came to the rescue and she was given a bag of feathers as a payment to get them down 
So when they got down, Spider Woman took off with the feathers. And she looked at these feathers, admired them four times. She would open the bag, look at it, admire it, and then take off again. And she did this four times. On the fourth time when she opened the bag, there was a gust of wind that, wind that came down and it blew the feathers up into the air. And when that happened, the feathers that blew up into the air turned into birds, all different birds. So that was the creation of birds. So that's how that I created this dress. Knowing that that girl's from that area, so I wanted to incorporate that story. The one below, um, it's one of my nieces. She's graduating from ASU. Um, so I kind of wanted to create that one, but that one is just like designs that I wanted to incorporate. And I wanted it to be kind of funky. So I just threw designs on designs. And then on the right with the black, that is based off of our, um, my mom is a big believer in the Native American church. And in Native American church, they use a lot of peyote. So my mother, being that person, was a big advocate for giving us the rights. You know, she was a big advocate when it came to um, passing the law for us natives to use peyote. And so she was a big believer of that. So I wanted to honor her by making this dress. So one side of the design is red, the other side is blue. You can't really see it, but it's there. Um, and that's kind of the colors that they use is red and blue. So I incorporated both of them into the, into the rug dress. And so it's believed that back in the day before it was legal, if you were caught performing Native American church ceremonies, you were arrested and you were tried and you were sentenced. So what happened was a lot of these times they would go up into the mountain away from people and they would perform these ceremonies out in the middle of nowhere at night. And if they got caught, what happened was they would give the, the peyote to a female and she would then hide it on her because they would never search a lady. That was the law. But the men, they would get searched, but the females, they wouldn't. So they would hide the peyote on them. And so my mom remembers that. And then also growing up, a lot of Navajos were against the idea of having this peyote ceremony on our, on our, in our, on our reservation. It was a ceremony that we adopted from the... Uh, Plain, Plains Indians and so a lot of people were against it you know they had all these different stories about how uh, I think one of my mom was telling me one of the stories that she told me about was people believed and they would say that if he used peyote or there was a lady that was eating peyote she was using peyote and when she gave birth she gave birth to a serpent <laughs> you know little stories like that to, to scare people and because they didn't want people to utilize peyote so there was a big push against peyote and but my mom was a firm believer of it and she helped support it she advocated for it um, today native american church is highly practiced on a reservation it's now accepted into our culture so a lot of people do go and perform and, and participate in these ceremonies so for that reason this girl and her family are also big um, they're really into this native american church and they practice it and it's part of their culture now so I went ahead and by honoring them, I went ahead and included that into the rug dress. The white design at the bottom, at the bottom you can't really see it, but there's like little lines. It's supposed to represent an eagle feather. Um, and, and typically with an eagle, you have 12 tilts. So when they create a fan for a young person, they only include 11. I was told to only do 11. And the last one, which is the 12th one, they would exclude it. That 12th feather would then be later added onto this person's fan once they, once they became wise, uh, once they went through all their trials and error and they're at that stage where they're matured, they would then add the 12th feather to the fan. And so a fan is something that they would carry. So in her rug dress, there's 11 lines to represent the 11 feathers. So like I said, I use my rug, my rug weaving as a form of telling stories, as a way for me to preserve my songs and prayers. Um, so this is just a little bit about my, my work. Um, as I mentioned, I've been weaving for eight years. Eight years has gone by really quick. Um, when I first started, it was just me weaving. And I got challenged to... We have a rug dress for a girl uh, who's transgendered. 
and I wove her a rug dress, and she wore that dress to the White House. And so my dress was actually featured at the White House, and she, she wore it on the night that Obama approved um, and legalized gay marriage. And so he, you know, when that happened, she wore it that night, and there was a dinner that was done before that announcement was made. So she actually has a picture of her and Obama with my dress on. So that was a huge honor for that to happen. Um, I've also been participating in the Santa Fe Indian Market, which is one of the largest Native American markets, one of the prestigious markets. To get into that market, you have to get juried in. So you have to get, show your work. You have to meet their standards to be qualified to get into that market. And I actually got, I got into that market my first year weaving, my very first year. Um, I've also been at the Herd Museum, and I've been to their Indian market for about seven years. And today, I demonstrated the Grand Canyon. So I, every twice a year, I travel up to the Grand Canyon, and I sit there and I demonstrate weaving. And I, I meet with people from all over the world, um, and I teach them how to weave. Um, I just got done recently. Um, last Saturday, I got done teaching at the Herd Museum. And I taught a family of, I believe, six families that I taught how to weave. And so weaving has opened up, like I said, has opened up a lot of doors for me. It's just not an art for me. Um, it also taught me how to dye, you know, like how to dye yarn with natural colors. So like I mentioned earlier, as I began, it opened up a lot of doors. And it has opened up a lot of doors. Um, also, I, I'm going to be using my weaving as a form of raising funds for a scholarship coming up. So in the spring, I'm working on a piece where I'm going to be raffling off or having a drawing for that piece to be able to, I guess, collect money for a scholarship for students. So it, it supported me in a lot of ways. It supported my family. And now I'm utilizing that art to support the community. So as I mentioned, it's opened up a lot of doors for me. Um, and then up here, you'll kind of notice, I kind of mentioned a little bit about my, my rug weaving. Um, this is also another form. Another form of this is another form of weaving that I've been working on. This is an experimental rug. But here, as I mentioned earlier, um, twill weaving. This is twill weaving. So here's one design. And then if I flip it over, got another design so this is called double-sided weave so this is another form of weaving that I've been kind of toying around with just you know so a lot of this is experimental so I have a lot of this kind of this stuff set up in my house and they're like rolled up or stashed away in my closet so what I'm doing a lot of times is I'm creating rugs I'm practicing on certain things and then I'm stashing them away like this piece here I've had this for probably four years now it's just been rolled up <laughs> so I thought I would bring it um, here's another one. this is also a small version of that just kind of my demonstration just to get a feel of it so this is called the diagonal weave um, and this this piece is actually this is how the Hopi tribe would actually weave their rugs or the Pueblos they did a lot of the diagonal weave and inside of it, you'll notice the exposed warps. So you'll kind of see the warps as well. So this is another one that I just kind of had out on display or just as a demonstration. And I'm trying to incorporate designs. So you notice I was trying to incorporate some designs within that rug. So you're more than welcome to come up and, and touch these after the presentation. But I kind of wanted to open up the floor um, for questions. Any questions, comments? Yes. You know, that's always, it's, I always hear that question. <laughs> um, you know, depending on the style, the design, um, whether I'm, if I'm creating, if I'm dyeing the yarn myself, dyeing the yarn could actually take a lot longer because you had to gather the supplies, you had to go out and harvest all these materials. Um, so that in itself could take about a month to get the yarn created, uh, to get them dyed. 
to do the actual weaving depending on the size. I've had one that I've worked on for probably three years. Um, it's a shirt that I should have displayed, but it was a shirt that I did three years. It took me three years to make. Um, the poncho probably took about three months. Um, smaller pieces like the one that I'm holding, that took about two months to create. Um, and then the dress itself, the dress is, it will take a little bit longer because you're weaving two identical rugs back to back. And you have to make, you have to make sure that the front design and the back design, they match up and they line up. So you don't want one higher than the other when it comes to design. So you have to really take your time with the rug dresses. Um, that could take up to like six months to create the rug dresses. And so every year I weave rugs for girls that are graduating like college or high school or celebrating some kind of celebration. So I normally take two rug orders per year only because it takes that long. And right now I'm actually booked until 2020, 2025. So yeah, so that's how far in advance I'm booked. Um, and some of these girls will be graduating in 2025. So they've already placed their orders you know they already have designs in mind so you know I'm, I'm starting to work on 2023 right now then i have 2024 then 2025 so it's become very lucrative you know it's become a very i guess profitable on my part um so yeah a lot of these rugs they'll you know they they, they take forever setting up you know, a lot of times you see these fashion designers and they, they just cut the materials and they sew things together. I'm not like that. I actually have to sit down and warp the material, set it all up. Then I have to start weaving it and finish it and then clean it, steam it, and then sew it together. So that's the like entire process. That's me creating the fabric, then sewing the pieces together to create the dress. So it does take up to, um, like I said, the longest was three years. So for red, for the color red, um, if you go out, if you go outside or into the desert here, you'll notice on the cactus, especially the big cactus petals, you'll notice this white fuzzy thing on it. Inside that white fuzzy is a bug. It's called cochineal. They're beetles. So you gather them and what you normally do is you gather them, you snuff them out and then you dry them and you grind it. You grind it to a fine powder, then you stew it. You literally stew it and you extract the dyes. From that, you get red. You get this very beautiful, bright red. And so you can dye like maybe four skeins of yarn at a time. The first, the first dye is going to be like this bright red. And then as the dye bath weakens, then you'll get like a pink and then pretty like different shades of pinks. So that's one. The other one is indigo, which is blue is another design or another dye that I used. You can use onion skins. I've used wild carrots, which produces some beautiful yellows. So out, in this, out on the reservation, there's this plant. It looks like a yam. It's like a big yam. And you dig it up during the springtime or early summer. You dig it up and you, you cut it up like banana chips and you dry it out. And they actually look like banana chips, but they're orange. And when you're ready to dye with it, you just boil it and it produces this almost yellow-orange color. Some really beautiful, intense colors. So you use that to get your orange, your, your yellowish-orange colors. Um, <clears throat> and then I've used brown, um, for browns, I've used walnut hulls. So I've got friends, and actually I just got an email this morning from a friend from California. They just collected like a bunch of walnut hulls and they want to ship it out to me. So I need to s respond to them, but I get friends from all over that, you know, they gather walnuts for me and they, they send it out to me and I use that to dye my browns. Um, purples, we use mushrooms, like there's various mushrooms that we use from the north, the um, like coastal area like Oregon and Washington. Um, in fact, I have one fermenting that's been fermenting about three months um, and it's supposed to produce purple, some beautiful purple. So I'm, I'm letting that set up. So that in itself, you know, you have to let it set up. Um, what else have I used? Um, I've over dyed some stuff. We use another one that's called rabbit brush. 
So there's a lot of plants that we use on the reservation. I could probably sit here and, and tell you all the things, but <laughs> there's a lot. And again, it's all experimental. Like I actually hang out in the desert here and I'm gathering certain plants. And I feel like a scientist, I feel like a mad scientist because I'm gathering stuff and I boil it and my place will reek like all these <laughs> different plants. And I dye things, you know, and I dip things in that and, and, and I keep track of everything. I log everything. And I usually have a sample of what color it produced, how much of it did I use, what mordant did I use. So mordant is a chemical that helps balance the colors. So mordant could be anything from rusted nails, like rusty nails, um, alum, citric acid, um, soda ash, vinegar, those are all mordants that I've used in the past and I still use a lot of them today and each one of them will react differently to each color. So like if I did, um, like for indigo for example, Zunis used to use urine to help balance the chemical. They would actually use urine. Navajos were afraid to use bodily fluids in their dye process. So what did they do? They used ash. Like they would burn juniper leaves or the needles and then the ash, they would then mix it. And it, it worked, you know, it, it worked. Um, and I've actually had the, just, <laughs> the opportunity to work with urine. <laughs> and it works well. I mean, it, it, it works well with indigo. You get these beautiful, intense blue colors, almost black blue. Um, but it's a very smelly process. So I had to research. Again, there's a lot of researching involved and I ended up coming up with diuretic acid and soda ash. And those two together actually do the same thing that the urine does, but in a much cleaner way. And so I've used that. So it's funny that you asked that question because like I said, there's a lot of research involved. There's a lot of talking with other people. And so I have this, I should have brought it, but I have this big book of all different yellows i mean different shades of yellow and how i got that yellow and then i have browns i have all these different browns and reds and blues and i mean you just name it i have all these different colors but it's fun to do it because you know you get tired of weaving weaving is fun but sometimes that gets boring so then i end up dyeing yarn or i'm blending wool colors together to produce different colors so yeah it's i have a lot you have a question Mm -hmm. Sash belts. I learned how to do it. I it's not my favorite. <laughs> it um it's a lot of thumping. A lot of um, you have to really beat down on that. So I've set it up. I got it ready. I I started weaving, and I used to live in an apartment complex where the floors were hollow, and I was living upstairs. And my neighbor, <laughs> poor thing, my neighbor um, would go crazy, literally go crazy. And we lived like that for three years. So I would, I would weave only when she was gone. And if I, <laughs> if I wove, I, she'd be banging on the wall and I, I'd had to stop. For that reason, I, I stopped doing the sash belts because it was, uh, it brings back a lot of bad memories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, but it was, it was, um, I love doing them. It's just, I need to find a place where it allows me to make that noise. But when I do go home to my mom's where like during the winter break, that's when I make my, my, my sash belt weaves. And that one is set up differently. You have to really spin the yarn, over spin the yarn, and then set it up in a, like just a regular, just like a over round and round and round. Whereas these ones, they're figure eights where they cross, they, they cross. And that one just goes round and round. It's just like a big circular pattern. And then you have to separate your warps and weave it. And so those are belts um, that we wear, or actually the women, they would wear it. And how they're worn in Navajo, for the Navajos, a lot of the girls would wear it. And it was very popular for pregnant women. So if a woman had a baby, and after they had their baby, they would push it on the stomach, and then they would get the sash belt and they would tie it around the waist to put down that baby bump, I guess, in a sense. So they would flatten out their stomach again. So that's how they would wear it, was around their, their waist, and they would pull it really tight. Ceremonies? Yeah. <clears throat> mm. 
I think we use red, green, and white in ours. Uh, that's one of the popular colors, but now I've seen people produce purples and all these different shades. It's, it's rather interesting, the level of our textiles, how they've advanced quite a bit. Um, I mean, I've seen rugs that were, they look like pictures, but they're not. Like I've seen a guy weave a rug with an old truck, like a shell of a truck in a desert. And I thought it was a painting. And when I walked up to it, it was actually a weaving. Um, there's another person that wove a rug with um, like three three guys on a horse overlooking Monument Valley. And I walked up to it and again, it was, it was a weaving. And so our textiles have really evolved over time. It's, it's, it's evolving and it's evolving more and more. And you know, like I just taught a group of students and I challenged them to get creative you know, don't stick with the old. You know, it's good to stick with the old, but get creative. Create outside the box. And I'm going to end it with this. Um, when I was learning how to weave, I had this guy. His name was Bruce McGee from the Herd Museum. Well-known collector. He's a very well-known collector. And, and basically said, you know, people my age are dying out. A lot of these old collectors are now leaving. And now you need to entertain and find new collectors. And you need to focus on the younger generation. So create something that they can connect with. And, and that, so that was the biggest challenge that he left me. So today, I hope I'm meeting that challenge. I feel like I'm, I am maybe to a certain point, but we'll see what happens. That's <laughs> so thank you for your time. Um, for those that showed up in person and those out in the virtual world, thank you for being here. I'm glad to share some of my weaving with you, my little presentation, and I hope you enjoyed it. So. Thank you.